What's Neat this week, it's April, and boy have we got a good show lined up for you this month. We open the show with Mike Buddy, who comes by with some magnificent, better than that, some of the best vehicles I've ever seen completely finished. Wait till you see what Mike's got to show us on this show. Also, we're going to cover foam glue, the different types of glue that we use to glue our layouts together and what really works, what's the best to use. I test out a variety of brands, and man, the tests are going to be interesting, so watch this. Then we're going to discuss lift-out sections. Again, we've talked about that in the past, but I'm going to show another way of building lift-out sections where they lift out, we can use them for photography, and it's easy to clean the layout and work on it out in the field. The last thing we're going to discuss is soldering. We're going to go over all the types of devices that are available for us in the market right now and how to apply them to the hobby. But first, I got to tell you what, when I'm working in the shop and I'm, I'm over there doing projects, I keep thinking about what Joe Fugate said to me and that's we're going to change the name of the show from what's neat this week to simply what's neat. So from now on, refer to the show as what's neat and I'm going to try to keep it neat for you. Now when I'm over there working in the shop, I listen to the radio once in a while, jam on the tunes loud when the family's not home. But when they're home and I'm trying to kind of in a conservative mood, I really enjoy listening to podcasts. It's an, a window to what's going on in the industry. You can hear a lot of educational things. And one of the most professional podcasts, and one that I really, really cling to every word of, is the Scotty Mason Show. It was Scott Mason that I listened to about two years ago when he had Dave Freire on, and all they talked about was DVDs and their next one coming out and this and that, and I couldn't stand it. I, I they, The enthusiasm that percolated from that show came through to me loud and clear, and it was Scott that made me get off my duff and actually start producing videos. So that's the, that's the kind of good stuff that comes from a podcast. And tonight on the show, we're going to open up the show with Scotty Mason. I've got him right here in the studio with us, Scott Mason. Hey, Ken, how are you? Scott, man, I'm doing really great. It's good to see you this evening. Great to see you, too. Thanks for the introduction, and thanks for having me on the show. Now, I love listening to your podcast. Like I said, it's, it's a wealth of information. It's very professionally produced and edited, and the same kind of works with your videos and what have you. Tell, tell us a little bit about Scott Mason and what you do for your professional time in the industry. Uh, well, you know, I, I, I got started as a professional in the hobby by accident, and I'm sure that's not unusual. Uh, several years ago, I uh, befriended uh, Bob Van Gelder, the owner of South River Model Works, and uh, he kind of took me under his wing and uh, showed me a lot of the tricks to craftsman structure building. It was something that always fascinated me, but I had no idea where to begin. His kits made it so simple, Ken, that, that really a motivated beginner could, could build them successfully. And over the course of our friendship, I had an opportunity to help him at uh, several of the shows he did. Uh, some across the country, and uh, it, it got me deeper into this. After uh, seven or eight years of that, I said to him one day, you know, wouldn't it be great if someone put out a DVD that answered some of the basic questions and showed some of the techniques that we discuss when we're standing here at our booth, show in and show out? And he said, sure, but, you know, who's going to do that? And uh, so... My niece's husband is a, uh, a professional cameraman for a uh, Boston area news station, and I talked to him about it, and the next thing you know, uh, we've got a DVD called Building Craftsman Structures Volume 1, and honestly, Ken, I thought I would sell about a dozen of these things, have a few laughs, kind of uh, puff up my ego a little bit and go on my way, and uh, we, uh, we did the production. I sent them off to the factory to be produced. I, I, I ordered an initial run of a 1,000. I started... Uh, marketing them on the um, internet forums and before they even came back I pre-sold over 500 so That's I, I knew I had found an itch well thank you but uh, uh, you know so it was it was received um, very nicely and, and you know I'm always thankful of, of you know all the clients that have ordered DVDs or structure kits from me over the years in fact I I could probably still name you the first dozen people that ordered DVDs way back in 2005 so that's really how I got my start and uh, things just really, really blossomed from there. Within a couple of weeks, people were calling me to build structures for them, uh, then layouts. And uh, so it's been one thing after another, and it's, it's been a great opportunity to uh, turn a hobby into a business. That's fantastic. Now, you invited me out to one of your Craftsman Structure shows, and I did a clinic out there. That was a really nice experience. Um, when I was listening to your podcast the other day, I think you said you've got a new DVD that's coming out on track. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, in fact, 
Great segue. <laughs> Checks in the mail again. Uh, this just came out. Uh, it's called uh, Building Realistic Track Work, Model Track Work, Volume 1. And it features uh, Jim Lincoln, who is a master track builder. And uh, as well as myself, who, uh, I, and I am not a master track builder, although I have built uh, a ton of track work in, in my day, but, but Jim is really the expert. Uh, I show some techniques using commercial track products, and then Jim jumps into the Fast Tracks products. And all I can tell you is that this is the Fast Tracks products are what led me to produce this DVD in the first place. I am so fascinated and thrilled that Tim Warris at Fast Tracks had the wherewithal to invent these products because it's created a renaissance as far as hand-laying track goes. Now, I'm an idiot when it comes to hand-laying track. Uh, I always wanted to do it, never could do it well. I had people that just spent hours upon hours trying to teach me how to hand-lay a switch, and I just couldn't do it. And I sat down, Ken, after we produced this DVD, uh, I still had all of the, uh, the tools and fixtures that Tim sent us here, and uh, I said, I'm going to try this. I sat down, it took me less than an hour to build my first turnout, I brought it down to the layout, plugged it in, the thing was perfect, foolproof, and, that, and I'm a fool, so I can tell you that uh, it's definitely foolproof. So if you, if you haven't tried the Fast Track products, if you're considering um, hand laying track on your next layout, this is the way to go, and this DVD will help you along the process. Jim did a great job of really um, making it look as easy as it really is. How many DVDs have you got now, Scott? Uh, I'm going to say 13, okay. uh, and, the, and the reason I say that is because we actually did one uh, for, in conjunction with my first Craftsman Structure Kit, which was a backwoods uh, wood three-stall roundhouse that came with the kit, so unless you bought the kit, you don't have the DVD, uh, so I include that in there, but uh, uh, yeah, it's, um, we did the first one, and, and obviously I saw that there was a market for them, and, and then it was just a question of... Uh, making a list of everything that I ever wanted to cover, everything that I wanted to teach, and, and, and what I didn't know, what I didn't feel comfortable teaching, I brought in people that could. And, and we've got DVDs uh, with Dave Ravella, Mike Rose, uh, the late, great, wonderful Brian Nolan, uh, Jim Lincoln, uh, and of course myself. Uh, there's also uh, uh, a DVD that features Dick Elwell in the Hoosick Valley Lines. And, uh, you know, people ask me which one is my favorite, and it's kind of like asking me which is my favorite child. But, boy, I'll tell you, I can, I can still watch that Dick uh, Elwell layout DVD and enjoy it. That's fantastic. Now, your podcast, tell us a little bit about that, what goes into making it. Tell, tell us about the podcast, the Scotty Mason Show Show podcast. Well, it, it's really a labor of love. And, and, you know, I know that you know what goes into doing these sorts of things uh, there really isn't a lot of payback. It's it's all about giving back to the hobby. That's why we started it in the first place uh, seven and a half years ago. We're coming up on eight years uh, for this podcast. So, uh, you know, we, we talk about, you know, every year we kind of talk about do we really want to continue to do this, but the thought of not doing it anymore, uh, you know, as difficult as it can be from time to time, uh, you know, really, really keeps us, uh, keeps us in the game. It's, uh, you know, it started off, it was myself, Jimmy Degnan, Doug Fiscali on the first podcast. And, and honestly, uh, you know, and, and, and those guys are great and they're, they're, they've been marvelous to the hobby. Uh, but they, they were certainly then somewhat shy. And uh, I realized that it was going to be two and a half hours of me talking and, and trying to pry information out of them. Uh, it wasn't really working too well. And on the second show, we brought in Dave Frary. And, uh, you know, that really, uh, he and I played well off each other. Um, you know, he's like a crazy uncle, and uh, we had a lot of fun, and we did that for four years, and uh, uh, it, it got to be a lot for them, and, and we uh, kind of retooled and changed casts, and I have Jimmy Simmons and uh, Joe Duckworth and Mike Rose with me now, and uh, you know, they are they're three incredibly talented people in, in very different ways. They all lend something very valuable to the podcast, and I'm thrilled to have them on a monthly basis, and... Uh, I'll tell you what, you know, time goes by fast. It, it, it seems hard to believe that it's been almost eight years, uh, but, uh, you know, I can see this going on for a while. There's, there's certainly no shortage of topics in the hobby, and, and as you know, the hobby's evolving, so there'll probably always be a, a wide range of stuff to talk about. I really enjoy listening to your show when you have Mike Rose on because Mike is always working on his layout. He always discusses the construction of things. Mike and I worked back on a project back in 19, uh, 2003. 
we did a cover of Craftsman together featuring a lot of Mike's freight cars and then I worked some scenes in around it so if you find that issue it's really worth looking at it's some great photography and uh, Mike Rose does some pretty good articles a lot of thorough material Scott before we let you go I want to discuss with you or have you tell us how people can find your website I know you can on the website listen to all these past podcasts if folks want to index through and listen to them they're very educational material the Dave Ferry stuff is priceless but tell us where to go to find Scott Mason online yeah, thanks, Ken. We, we just actually had a complete retooling of the website, which was about five years overdue. It's uh, the, the address is www.scottymason.com. That's Scotty with a Y. And uh, one of the things that we did was make it easier to navigate. There was a lot of clutter in there, a lot of things that needed to go bye-bye. Uh, so uh, Bob Sprigg in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, redid it for me and did a great job. And uh, so it's easy to navigate, easy to order. Uh, there's still a lot of good information in there, and I would suggest that if you've got a couple of hours to kill, you go in and you read the Penzi Diary. It's the story of the um, renovation of the uh, Penzi Middle Division layout that Dave Frary built for Model Railroad Magazine in 1993, and uh, Jimmy Degnan came to own, and I renovated it and restored it for him, uh, along with some other talented modelers, and it's uh, interesting reading. Great, Scott. Well, listen, everybody, this is Scotty Mason, Respected Podcast. Uh, check it out. Thank you very much, Scott. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. For this segment of What's Neat This Week, I've got Mike Buddy, who found another great set of automobiles that are worth paying attention to for our modeling and our, on our layouts. I recognize the 1986 Jeep Grand Cherokee that we're about to look at because Jörg from Switzerland had that vehicle published in Model Railroad Hobbyist magazine not too far in the past uh, couple magazines ago. And I recognized it because his stunning photography, he went for only the very best of what he could find. So with that, let me hand this over to Mike and let's find out about another great new product. Well, Ken's right. This is uh, one of the finest HO scale models you can get nowadays. They come from a company called Neo and they have a uh, etched metal detail, window frames, mirrors, the grills are all etched metal, uh, license plates, all the chrome trim, everything is done. There's really not much you can do to these right out of the box, except maybe add a little dirt to them. Now did you say these have etched steering wheels in them? Yes, can you focus in on the station wagon yes. or, or that Buick Riviera? And uh, they all have prototypical prototypically correct mirrors. They have uh, decals on the dashboards to represent gauges and stuff. These are Ford, beautiful. Yeah, Ford pickup. And they come in a lot of different colors too. All factory colors. So I was very impressed with these. I, I haven't seen anything better than this yet. Mike, these are really amazing. All right. Thank you a lot for sharing this with us on the right. What's Neat This I'll Week. See you next time. For this segment of What's Neat This Week, I want to discuss glues and gluing foam. Now for years I've been using great stuff. It's cheap, three, four dollars a can. You weight it, you put weight on it. I've never had a problem with foam separation. It works. The only thing I don't like about it is how it does expand and that I've always got to put weights on the models. Something I want to try today, a friend of mine, John Ellibrock, suggested using 3M's 77 glue. Well I picked up some 77 glue I picked up some 90 super strength glue, and I also picked up some Loctite spray adhesive. So I want to try all three of these glues on foam and just see the resiliency and how the strength, the tinsel strength is of this glue. So I'm going to start with the Loctite. Now the instructions state that you should apply the glue and then let the glue set until the two pieces sort of get tacky and then you put it all together. And so that's what I'm going to try here. So this is a Loctite. This is a 3M77. And 
next is the 3M90 high strength. About $15 a can for the high strength glue, $13, $14 a can for the other glues. Now I'm going to let these set in the wind for just a few minutes. Not even a few minutes, let's just go for a few seconds here because I can already see their drying starting to get tacky. And then I'm going to put them together and see which one holds up the best. So here's the Loctite. I can already feel it's a serious bond. Now we'll see what happens. I also want to try regular foam in this experiment. So I'm going to take a couple pieces of foam and just glue it together with the regular normal foam that we're all used to using. I'll just put these together foam to foam. And I'll drop a weight on top of this. Okay, everything's been drying for about three hours now, so let's see the results of the glues. I'm starting with the 3M High Strength 90, which I glued together a couple pieces of foam, and let's see if these come up. These came right apart, pretty easy. And if you look, it's it's eaten into the foam. So what that means is if you're going to use the 90, uh, you want to you want to paint the foam first to seal it because you don't want your chemicals eating the foam. That's the 90. Let's try the Loctite spray adhesive. That's the next one right here. And I gotta tell you what, this ain't come apart. Oh, it came apart. It's still sticky inside, so it needs more than three hours, and it is eating into the foam. So here's another one where you've got to seal the foam before you use it. I bet if you put these back together and put, put a weight on them for overnight, that might hold pretty good. Here's the 77, the 3M77. That's pretty good. I mean, you know, it's not bad. It comes apart. And it did not eat the foam. If you set that overnight, that might set up even better. But now, yeah. okay, here's uh, Great Stuff Foam Pro. That's the orange stuff. Well, I gotta tell you what, this one's not coming apart. Oh. All right, that passes. Great stuff in the can that you can buy for three dollars. This one's not coming apart either. I mean, I could force it apart. Let me try to force it apart and see if it takes the foam. It came apart, and it took the foam with it. The glue didn't break. The foam pulled away. It actually has the foam stuck to it. So I want to tell you what, I'm still going to stick with the great stuff because if I'm building a courtroom model for court or if I'm building a module for somebody, I really want it to last a few years. I don't want to take any risks of the foam separating. But I can tell you with this great stuff, we've got a winner. So that's my suggestion for glue and foam together. You just pull weights on it. You're going to have to weight it down so it doesn't expand. It's the only drawback to using great stuff. But the fact is it works. For this segment of What's Neat This Week, you, in the September issue, we discussed modular layout construction and how viable it is and how wonderful it is when it comes to taking a section out of your layout and being able to work with it quickly. Well, I've taken a section out of the layout today that I've actually never had out before, and I'm doing a shoot on it presently outside, and I want, to know, I want you to know how easy it was to work this out. Now, this is a back section that's got a trestle on it, and it had a double-track main line. And right now she's outside getting shot with a couple of Bachman locomotives for this afternoon's photo shoot. And this diorama looks really good set up out here. I got good sun today, great day to work. Glad I'm not shooting video because we're harvesting the corn in the backyard so I've got a great level of sound and noise. But this diorama, after it got vacuumed off and cleaned up, made for just a great photo shoot prop this afternoon. And that's, that's the advantage to being able to take your section out. You're able to take it out, vacuum it, clean it, refresh it, work the scenery on it, and then put it right back into the layout, fresh as new. So that's just kind of a tip. It works. I've proven it. And I suggest that if you all want to do outdoor photos with your layout, this would be a great concept, a great way to do it. So that's the tip for this uh, month's What's Neat This Week.
For this segment of What's Neat This Week, I want to discuss soldering. I've got a new upcoming video that's going to be on KenPatterson.com on my website on how to solder and how to take all of this equipment and apply it to your model railroad. But for this video, I just simply want to go over the types of equipment that's out there now for our uses and, and how to use them, how to apply this to our model railroading needs. Each type of equipment that I'm going to discuss has got its own separate pur purposes, although a lot of them can overlap. Starting with your old grandpa's handgun, if you can remember the old Weller handguns, the 125 watt units, most people have melted a lot of railroad ties using these things, but they work really good for soldering your track together. You can find one of these on eBay for about 10 bucks. Normally what we like to use is pencil tip soldering irons, and there's various types of them. They come with bases and fancy knobs, but I like the simple ones. The larger ones are really good for O scale, and almost large scale track. The smaller ones are excellent for doing HO scale track and our HO scale wiring. This is what you really need to get started with and these will last you a great many years. They simply don't wear out. You can find them for as low as five or ten dollars and I've also discovered units that have got adaptable blades on them so you can use them for cutting into plastic, making shingles on the side of a building, anything like that. A lot of stone work you can do in Wathers plastic buildings when you're, when you're super detailing them with a knife cutter like that. As we move up the scale now we're getting into the more useful units where they've got temperature degrees on them. They'll show either in Celsius or Fahrenheit how what the temperature of the needle is so in Fahrenheit about 800 degrees uh, in Celsius around 480 degrees and these work great because you can adapt a lot of different types of tips on them I've got a knife tip on it I've got pencil tips very heavy tips a lot of different tips usually they come with about 10 you can buy a unit like this on eBay for about 50 bucks now resistance soldering rig that's what this is when you use one of these units, you'll see when I step on the foot pedal switch, I get instant heat in the tip of the nozzle. And as you see the nozzle heats up the brass, everything instantly melts together. If you use liquid soldering like I'm doing here in this video, I'm putting liquid solder onto the piece of metal, I'm hitting the foot switch, and you get instant heat instant bond. It's almost like using hot melt glue. And, and this unit is absolutely usable for building brass models. If you're building brass, you want that area to get very hot quick so the surrounding brass doesn't cool off and also melt and your whole structure starts coming apart. I also use the resistant soldering rig for doing garden railroad track. When I've got a solder wire on a code 250 rail, that's pretty heavy. And any of these other units would get the rail too hot and melt the ties. With the instant heat that you get from a resistant soldering rig, it makes jobs that you couldn't ordinarily do doable. Now, as we get up higher into the scale, Radio Shack sells a pretty nice soldering rig, two-piece unit, simple pencil tip. I haven't found a lot of different types that I can put onto this one. I, I inquired about that and couldn't find any. It's got a very fine tip on it for doing electronics work. So if you're fixing cell phones and things like that, it has nothing to do with the hobby. you got a side income. These are great for that. This is really almost too small for working on track. It doesn't heat it up quick enough, but it's a great unit. It's got temperature displays on it, preset temperature displays, and a knob. So you don't have to push buttons and wait for things to get hot. The last unit that I want to talk about is, is the Kreml of the Krem. This is a unit that's got the variable speed temperature readouts for the fine point soldering tip. It comes with about 12 different size tips, so the versatility is there for all uses in the hobby. Another interesting thing it's got is a 12 volt power supply in the front. So if you're at the workbench and you want to test something, test a joint, test the, the lines on one of your resistors, you can do that with the 12 volt power supply. Another feature that this has got, and this has become really big in the last 15 years, is using air to solder with. As you see in this clip, I'm using the pencil tip point air to loosen up the solder on the circuit board, and by doing it that way, you're soldering with air, you're not touching a very hot point onto the electronics, and you also get an even flow over a large area so that you can take a lot of liquid solder and heat it up in a quick hurry using this unit. So something new, if you're into electronics, soldering with air works really well. I have also discovered that when I'm out on a photo shoot and I'm drying the bottom of the feet of people after I put that glue on them, that tacky glue to make them stand up, it takes a long time for that to dry, but with this gun I can quickly speed it up. So I found a lot of other modeling uses out of this 
this heat gun. So that's just kind of an overview of some of the soldering equipment that's out there. Um, and that's all I wanted to discuss at this point on this tape.